Remember when you were a kid and, you know, um, you were going on the school trip and you woke up before your parents and you were dressed? <laughs> you were ready to go? You didn't, your mother didn't have to go in and wake you up four or five times. You were dressed and ready to go. Why? So then we said last night that your biology, your neurocircuitry, your chemistry, your hormones, your genetic expression, your health is all equal to how you think, act, and feel. You with me? So then how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality. And we said your personality creates your personal reality. So if 95% of who you are by the time you're 35 years old is a set of memorized behaviors, emotional reactions, beliefs, perceptions, and attitudes that function like a subconscious computer program below your conscious awareness, then for the most part, most people are unconscious all day long. Would you agree with me? So you can't take it personally because they're just running on a program. And so then we said last night, it usually takes what? Crisis or trauma or disease or loss. And then people wake up and all of a sudden they begin to become aware of how they're being. And because they feel differently, they can look at themselves for the first time. And that concept in neuroscience is called metacognition. And because of the size of the frontal lobe, 40% of the brain, that's where your self-awareness exists. And it means then you could modify your state of being to do a better job in life. You can look at yourself, think about what you're thinking about. And one of the greatest moments in my life is when I realize just because I have a thought doesn't necessarily mean it's true. In other words, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> and once I realized that I had the choice to either empower that thought or not, all of a sudden I was able to observe it. So you would have to agree with me then that if you're observing your thoughts, it means now you're no longer the program. You're the consciousness observing the program and you begin to separate yourself from that automatic unconscious state of being. How many people are with me? And wouldn't you agree then if you were changing a habit, whether you wanted to lose weight or stop smoking or stop eating chocolate, or whatever people do, you're going to have to look at the things that cause you to return back to the same choice. And you're going to review in your mind, oh my gosh, I know that little devil's going to come up and say, go ahead, you know, start tomorrow, chocolate's good for you, it's all right, you know, everybody else is eating it, you know. And you have to become selective about that thought's going to come up and you have to overcome that thought. Would you agree? Because that thought's going to lead to the same choice, right? So you have to review in your mind who you no longer want to be. And then you're going to have to observe your behaviors. And as you begin to observe your behaviors, you're going to have to make a decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision carries a level of energy that's greater than the hardwired programs in your brain and the emotional addiction or memory in your body. And your body responds to a new mind. It gets a rush of energy. And when it gets that rush of energy, you're giving it a sampling of the future. You're grabbing the reins of the stallion. And you're pulling those reins in and you're saying, I'm the boss. And the body, the animal, begins to respond to your mind. And then you have to look at the emotions, the feelings that you look forward to, whether it's guilt or shame or unworthiness, that's become so familiar, you don't even know that you're feeling that way. It just feels like you. And you have to decide then, does this emotion belong in my future? Do I want to bring this into my future? Because as long as I'm living by this emotion, I'm living in my past. So then as you begin to observe those states of mind and body, you begin to objectify your subjective self. And just like viewing a videotape of yourself, playing baseball, playing tennis, dancing a dance, speaking publicly, whatever it is, if you can observe yourself, it means you can self-correct better. Wouldn't you agree? So then the process of change then is becoming conscious of your unconscious self. And when you begin to decide every day who you no longer want to be, you are, you are retiring the old self. And the body will crave the emotional payoff just like an addiction. 
And you have to understand that that's the biological, neurological, chemical, hormonal, physiological, genetic death of the old self. And when you begin to understand that, you can work then in creating a new self. And you can begin to emotionally give your body a taste of the future ahead of the actual event. And as we said last night, the emotional signature is exactly what signals the gene because the body does not know the difference between the actual experience in your life that creates the emotion and the emotion that you're fabricating by thought alone. To the body, it's the same. So the materialist would say, I can't give thanks for my wealth because it hasn't happened. Well, that's because you believe that your personality somehow is being created by your personal reality. In other words, your environment is controlling how you think and feel. That's the Newtonian model of reality. But the quantum model of reality is how you think and feel begins to affect your external environment. So then, as you begin to decide what thoughts you do want to fire and wire in your brain, and you move into a new state of being, and when from that state of being you begin to plan your behaviors, instead of obsessing about all the worst things that could happen to you, you start obsessing about what you're going to do with all your wealth, with all your health and vitality, with all your freedom. And as you begin to plan your behaviors and rehearse your actions, your brain does not know the difference between the external experience and the internal experience because if you're present with what you're doing, the thought is the experience. How many people are with me? And the brain captures a thought as the experience because of the size of the frontal lobe. That's the crowning achievement of the human being. That's where you create from. And as you begin to speculate possibilities and you review it over and over again, the frontal lobe silences the circuits in your brain that has to do with all the chatter. It's the symphony leader, and it cools off the voices and the chatter in your mind, and it begins to randomly select new networks of neurons based on what you've learned intellectually and what you experienced. And as the brain, the frontal lobe begins to select different networks of neurons, it creates a picture, and that picture is called an intention. And that intention, then, is your compass to the future. And then when you can combine that clear intention with an elevated emotion, and men will say, well, I don't know how it's going to feel because I haven't experienced it yet. Really? Well, how would you feel if your wealth came? Happy? Gratitude? Appreciating life and love with life? Give your body a sampling of the future. Let it, let it begin to taste the future. And if you do that, then your body is beginning to change to look like the experience has already happened. So now, if your brain and body show physical evidence that the experience has already happened, then your brain and body are no longer living in the past. Now, in fact, they are a map to the future. And to live by this law is to live by the quantum law. And the quantum law says your environment is an extension of your mind. And if you truly change your mind, there should be evidence in your life. People said, it's impossible, it's never going to work. And you had this vision of the future. And they couldn't see the vision that you were seeing. And you were inspired by the vision, which means your body was getting a taste of the future. You were already in that future, but they were in the past. And they were talking you out of it, you know. Well, what about this? And what about that? And what's going to be going to do if this happens? And you're thinking that is incidental. That's minor because I'm already there. I'll deal with it when it happens. And you made a decision about that future, and your body became electric. And when it began to respond to your mind, you began to have the hair on the back of your neck stand up, and you were already experiencing the event ahead of the experience. So all of the wealth and the relationships and all of the things that you want in your life is for the emotional payoff, isn't it? So why wait for the experience to have the emotion? That's what the Creator would say. A Creator has already experienced it enough times that their brain and body already know what it's going to be like. But here's the payoff, though. The payoff is that when it actually happens, it's greater than you could imagine because your senses are now involved in the whole experience. And the, the quantum field, then, is the, is the organizer of the event. 
It's not you that does it. It's a greater mind that begins to organize it in a way that you least expect. It has to come in a new and unusual way because if it doesn't, then it's nothing new. Would you agree? So then if you knew, you knew today that you were connected to a future and you were passionate about it and you were possessed by that possibility and every day you kept imprinting into the field and you were already experiencing that event and you knew it was going to happen because your brain and body were unified in a state of coherence, tell me how you'd get up in the morning. Pretty excited, huh? You wouldn't be dragging your body around the house trying to wake it up, right? I call that the school trip phenomenon. You know the school trip phenomenon? Remember when you were a kid and you know um, you were going on the school trip and you woke up before your parents and you were dressed? <laughs> you were ready to go? You didn't, your mother didn't have to go in and wake you up four or five times. You were dressed and ready to go. Why? Because something novel was going to happen. You were looking forward to something new. You were out of routine. What happened to us? That's because the body is already in the event. It's, it's craving the unknown. You with me? So then, when you begin to see a possibility and you connect with that potential in the quantum field, and how many potentials are in the quantum field? A few? Oh, you would say infinite, yes? So with infinite possibilities that exist in the quantum field, there's infinite experiences, yes? Poke the person next to you, come on. So if there's infinite experiences, then there's infinite emotions. Would you agree? So it has nothing to do with guilt and shame and unworthiness because the new experiences have everything to do with awe and wonder and magic and mystery. And so then if you're creating your future because the best way to predict your future is to create it every day, not from the known but from the unknown, then your body should be waking you up in the morning like a school trip and saying, we got something to experience today. And it is ex that exact energy of expectation that welcomes the unknown, that welcomes the mystery, that welcomes the, the miraculous in your life.